that it was very good at crushing bone and shearing tissue. Other things we can do, looking at the diet of T-Rex, we can actually come up with very, very, very sophisticated models to actually reconstruct how strong T-Rex could bite. There are more people studying how hard animals bite things than you might imagine. It's a very interesting uh, way to study them. A friend of mine, Florida State University, Greg Erickson, who you've seen some of his slides, does experiments with living animals to infer the behavior and the structure of fossils. And so one of the things he does is he takes a pressure bar. A pressure bar is basically a sensor that you can grab and squeeze and will tell you how much pressure, how much force you're putting on that bar. So what Greg likes to do is he likes to walk up to crocodiles, take that pressure bar and stick it in their mouths. And they chomp and he records how much pressure they bite with. Um, he's almost gotten killed a couple of times trying to do that. But he's got some very interesting results. To give you some sense of the pressure that a crocodile can bite, an American alligator, when it chomps down on you, the pressure that it bites with is about 5,000 pounds per square inch. That's a lot. When it bites down, you're not going to pull your hand down. 5,000 pounds per square inch. So with T-Rex, what we can do is we can model the muscles of the jaw, we can measure the jaw, and we can actually construct computer models, which is what you were seeing with that blue representing a model pressure bar, what that would be like. And when we model that, what we get is the strongest bite force of any animal that has ever lived on the surface of the planet. The most powerful bite of any terrestrial animal. And the strength is about 10,000 pounds per square inch. That means for every square inch of the T-Rex's mouth that touches you is putting in 10,000 pounds of pressure. There is not a tissue in your body that can survive that. If that animal bites, you're done. Other things we know, we know about what T-Rex ate. Why? Because we have bite marks on dinosaur bones. So to the right there is part of the hip of a triceratops. It's just a chunk of the hip, but you see all those ridges and grooves on that hip? Those are grooves from the teeth of a T-Rex pulling them tissue off the hip of that, t -rex, of that triceratops. So why would you do that? Because that's what the best meat is on the bottom. These are bones of, of, of one T-Rex with the bite marks of another T-Rex on it. So the T-Rex probably engaged in a little bit of cannibalism. T-Rexes would eat other T-Rexes. That's very common, actually, in reptiles. So we can look at the damage to other animals. We can look at the shape of the teeth of T-Rex. We can model its bite forces. And we know that this was an animal that was eating meat, a lot of meat, enough meat to, again, to grow at that incredibly fast growth rate. Now, you may have heard that there is a debate over whether or not T-Rex was a scavenger or a predator. And there's no one. That's just really for the that's PR stuff. And the reason is, is because all animals that eat meat are both scavengers and predators. Lions, the majestic, beautiful lion. Think about lions as this noble creature from cartoons. And then we have hyenas, and they're kind of shifty and sneaky looking. They're, they're scavengers, and the lions and predators. Not really. Lions are scavengers all the time. In fact, a lot of lion kills are things they chase hyenas off from. Hyenas are also, are also predators. So animals scavenge, and they are predators as well. When you do that sort of thing, when you eat fresh or dead meat, you can end up making yourself sick. So one of the things we do when we look at the bones of fossil animals is we can actually see disease. Now, when Sue was first found in 1990, there was a lot of stuff said about her in the press that hadn't been done scientifically. They said she was blind in one eye because there was a scar on her skull. And that she had been bitten on the face by another T-Rex because there were two holes. Well, there are holes in, in Sue's jaw, but those holes are actually not from being bitten by another T-Rex. There is the lower jaw of Sue, those white triangles show all those weird looking holes. What those holes are, are actually the results of disease. That is, tissue damage, damage to Sue's bones because she was sick. By the way, we call her she, we don't know if Sue was a female. We have no way right now of just looking at a T-Rex to tell whether it's a queer or not. So here's the lower jaw of Sue, and it's got all these holes in it. Well, it's pockmarked when you go out today. Go look at your skull and see these weird holes. So first big question in it. What happens is that if you eat rotten meat, or an animal that is infected with a particular type of bacteria, 
that bacteria will infect you and it will settle in your bones and it will actually create abscesses and sores and it will break apart your bones and create these pockmarks. That is the lower jaw suit. That is the lower jaw of a hawk or a falcon. I cannot remember which, but the one is it's got a bunch of holes in its lower jaw. And it got those holes in its lower jaw because it ate an infected pigeon. The T Rex was eating infected meat. Sue was sick. Sue was so sick it may have killed her. That Tyrannosaur, being very old, is riddled with disease. You can see it in both of her lower jaws, those very big holes. We think, but do not know, that those diseases may have been terminal because there's not a lot of rehealing. Sue has a ton of broken bones. If you go out today and look at her, you'll notice her ribs have a bunch of what look like cysts on them. Those are rehealing fractures. She broke her, one of her arms is broken. Oh, she was a beat up old girl. But the diseases are not really rehealed. So we think maybe the disease is bitter. Other important things about T-Rex, why we care about T-Rex. T-Rex is a beautiful piece of evidence of evolution. Descent, Darwin's descent with modification. The adaptation and, and evolutionary change in organisms to create new species over time. Well, a lot of what we do is we reconstruct the relationships of animals over time by looking at their anatomy. How many people here have ever done that with the Thanksgiving wishbone? Right? You break the wishbone, you get the short end, you don't get your wish, you get the long end, you get your wish. That is the wishbone of a turkey. It has a scientific name, it's called the furculum. And the furculum has an important function in the turkey. It sits right here, if you feel right there, your collarbone, called your clavicle, is actually the same set of bones as the furculum. And the bird there fused together to form a boomerang shape, and they sit right where our collarbones do. And the purpose of those bones is actually to support flight muscles and to support the shoulder blades, the front of the shoulders. So that up there is the wishbone of a turkey. Here is the wishbone of another turkey right down here. And then that big boomerang shaped bone right there is the wishbone of Sue. You can go out and see Sue's wishbone. She had a furcule. That little tiny boomerang shape, you can see it right up there between what looked like two big pie plates. Those are parts of the shoulder girl. The arrow is pointing to the shoulder blade on another specimen, or to the furcule on another specimen right there. T-Rex had a wishbone. T-Rex had hollow bones, just like birds do, modern birds. Structure of the skull, bones of the skull, just like modern birds do. With the renewed interest in paleontology, especially in dinosaurs over the last 30 years, and the opening up of the fossil resources in China, we now have amazing new discoveries about evolution of birds from T-Rex and its relatives. Feathers. What are feathers for? What do birds use their feathers for? Fly. Fly. All right. Birds, if you, if you pluck a chicken, they have these really little pinky arms. Now, chickens are not great flyers. But if you pluck a condor or an eagle, they'll also have those pinky little arms. Birds fly because they have these long feathers that provide control for them. They can lift themselves with it. Well, if you just looked at living animals, you would think the feathers evolved just for flight. But if you look at the fossils, you find something else. This little guy here is a tiny little meat-eating dinosaur related to T-Rex called Sinoceropteryx prima. It's from the early Cretaceous of China. That is one specimen of Sinoceropteryx. That's another specimen right there. What you have is you've got his head is kicked back, and then it curves around, and his tail is going straight up. These animals are so well preserved, we actually can see remnants of their soft tissues. Not just bones. So you notice that big black circle right there? That's the carbonized remains of the eye. That is the carbon that was in the eye of this animal 130 million years ago. If we take a close look, Sinus Roberts had a mohawk. That dark line going down the back, those are what we like to call proto feathers, very simple feathers. And they ran down the middle of the back of Sinus Roberts. So there they are above the eye going down the neck. And if you look at the big specimen, they go there, and then you can see kind of tufts of them going up the tail. This is a little dinosaur with simple feathers. They don't cover the whole body. They're not flight feathers. They're using them for something else. We actually find the oldest evidence of feathers in these non-bird dinosaurs. Here's another one, Pinnipter Zhouai, a dinosaur, also from the early Cretaceous of China. China's been very big to its fossil lives. It has a little stumpy tail, specialized feature of the tail called the pipe style, from which in modern birds you have a big explosion of feathers. It's got little tiny forearms, and coming off of those forearms, off of its arms, there's a series of feathers on the back side. 
Again, not of the whole body, because feathers and spots, and they're not flight feathers. So why would you have feathers like that? You use them for the same reason as peacock uses them. Display, communication. It's the dinosaur way of saying, hey, baby, whatever. Nice to meet you. These animals probably were using their feathers for communication, to attract a mate, to repel a competitor. Feathers probably first evolved as a way to communicate, and then only later did they evolve for flight. And we know this from looking at the fossils. So where do we actually find flight feathers? Well, the first good flight feathers come from this guy over here, Archaeopteryx lithographica. From the lithographic limestones of Bavaria in southern Germany, 145 million years old, we now have 10 specimens of Archaeopteryx. There are nine of them are in Europe. One of them is in Thermopolis, Wyoming. So if you want to get in your car and spend a day's drive, you can actually go see one of the best fossils in the world. Archaeopteryx has a fairly normal dinosaur body, except it has big arms, and it has feathers preserved, flight feathers. The feathers you would see, if you looked at the feather of an Archaeopteryx and the feather of a modern bird, you would never tell them apart. This is the first evidence of flying and gliding. Archaeopteryx is probably not a strong flyer. How many of them here like the white meat on a chicken or a turkey? All right. Those are the flight muscles. They're huge, great big. Now, granted, meat, royal turkeys and chickens have bigger and bigger flight muscles. But on any bird, great big flight muscles. How are those muscles? Archaeopteryx did not have the bones for great big flight muscles. But it had flight feathers. It was probably gliding and flapping its arms fairly poorly. But we actually find flight feathers. And so here, what you're looking at is this branching diagram shows the relationships of dinosaurs to birds over time. So those blue bars up at the top are millions of years ago, from 240 to 110, that is millions of years after that. And those branching diagrams show the patterns of relationships. Now, when you think of dinosaurs, you think of T-Rex and Triceratops. Just like you are more closely related to your brothers and sisters than you are to your cousins, T-Rex and a blue jay are more closely related to each other than I go to Mr. Triceratops. Birds are a type of dinosaur. They are, pardon the pun, nested within dinosaurs. Just like we are a type of mammal, birds are a type of dinosaur. If you've ever dealt with a blue jay, there's probably no doubt <laughs> that they're dinosaurs. They're incredibly aggressive, mean little butters. Right up there. That's an artist reconstruction of what the velociraptor may have looked like. We now know that the velociraptor had feathers on it. So they're from Velociraptor to that blue jay, not the huge stretch. So here we have these patterns of relationships showing birds nested within dinosaurs. What does that mean? That means did dinosaurs go extinct? No. There are 10,000 living species of dinosaurs today. You are feeding them when you fill up your feet. It is something to really think about. So, what about the Nebraska connection? How's our fossil record of dinosaurs? Are there dinosaurs in the rest of the world? There's this thing on I-80 when you drive west. <laughs> you've never seen it. It's just, I was one off the road. I gotta be honest, the first time I drove out. Um, so there's a life-size T-Rex threatening truckers on I-80, west of Lincoln. Then if you go to Moral Hall, you'll see a really antiquated version of what we thought dinosaurs looked like. There's a curator there, I'm working to update that. So you can see dinosaurs in Nebraska, but we don't really have many fossils of dinosaurs in Nebraska. The reason is is because we're mostly in the world. We have a couple. There's a partial hip of a duckbill dinosaur, there's some teeth, and there's a trackway. The body fossils of Nebraska dinosaurs are probably from what we like to call bloat and float specimens. I think you can guess what that means. So these are animals that probably died in what would be South Dakota today, were washed into the ocean, bloated up, and then floated out until they rotted. And then their bones settled down into the sediment of what is now Nebraska. So we have very few dinosaurs in Nebraska. But we have amazing fossils in Nebraska. We're covered in water, shallow, warm seaways, filled with a diversity of life. Giant marine reptiles like mosasaurs, long-necked plesiosaurs, incredible sharks, fantastic sharks, diversity of sharks like we never seen. Are in Nebraska. This is what Nebraska would look like if it is the T-Rex. The first swimming birds are actually from Nebraska. Now, how many people here have ever seen hen's teeth? Checking teeth. 
Probably not. The expression rare as hen's teeth is for a very good reason. Living birds don't have teeth. They've lost them, but the first true marine birds still had their teeth. We have fossils of toothed birds. So we have this great fossil record in Nebraska. Because, I don't know if you folks knew this, Nebraska is one of the most important paleontological resources on Earth. But that's not a perfectly that's not a joke. If you go to any of the, nat the major natural history museums in the world, the Smithsonian, the American Museum of Natural History, the Field Museum in Chicago, Los Angeles County Museum, Denver Museum of Nature and Science, British Museum of Natural History, Museum d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris, Museum for Nathalie in Berlin, uh, what about the Heritage in Moscow, all of the new museums in Japan. Guess what they have? Nebraska fossils. Anyone here ever been to Scotts Bluff? That area out there. Fantastic fossils in Agate National Park. Well, people come from all over the world to cut the parts of that bone bed out of Agate and take them to the museums. We have one of the most important continuous fossil records in the world. So here we are in the green from this colored map. This is not some weird flashback. This, is, this, is. this colored map shows the distribution of rocks with different ages of rocks and different colors. Is anyone here from Peru down southeast? Down there, but everyone knows where Peru is. Okay. So the rocks around Peru, those blue rocks down there, those rocks are about 290 to 300 million years old. Really old rocks, and they preserve amazing fossils. Some of the first animals with four legs to live on here. Primitive amphibians, relatives of frogs and salamanders. The oldest relatives of our rocks come from rocks right down there. Then we get into those greens. And those greens, where we are, we're in the dark green and the Lincoln is in the light green. Those rocks are Cretaceous aged. This is the age of T Rex. And the green rocks in Nebraska are marine rocks, ocean rocks. And they're filled with ocean fossils. Then we get into your yellows and your buff colored, and that is younger rocks. And that is actually where we have our most amazing fossil record. That is fossils from the age of mammals. And the rocks that we have really good records from are from about 37 million years to today. And we have those rocks dated very finely so we know how old things are very precisely. And we can record how the environment has changed over the last 37 million years. This is, of course, asphalt up by Royal, part of the University of Nebraska system. This is a mass death assemblage of rhinos and horses and camels. And now we know snakes and turtles and the diversity of birds. There's a huge fauna and ecosystem up there that 13 million years ago was living in ponds. As Yellowstone in Wyoming was erupting and belching ash into the sky, a bunch of ash built up like a sand dune, but it'd be an ash dune. And then one day it went and it covered that pond, and then it rained down for about two months covering that pond, and slowly killed everything in the pond, including our herd rhinos. So we have perfectly preserved rhinos. These fossils are so well preserved, we have mothers with babies, and we can actually tell whose baby goes with which mother, and some of the mothers are protecting them. So we have this fantastic fossil record. Elephants. Nebraska is ridiculous with elephant fossils. There are elephant fossils recovered from all but two counties in the state. There are no elephants alive in North America today except for in zoos, or ones that have gotten away from safaris. But from the last ice age, back to about 18 million years, we were lousy with elephants. You couldn't walk a mile without running into an elephant in the rest. We had this tremendous fossil record, and it's an important fossil record because it tells us about how climate the world has changed over time. Other things that are going on, and here's a naked plug from my work in my museum. Coming to Nebraska Hall, February 2014, is the exhibit Titanobo, a monster snake. This is work I did describing the world's largest snake. What does this have to do with T-Rex? Titanobo was bigger than T-Rex. <laughs> this is a 50-foot-long snake from 60 million years ago in South America. It's the world's largest snake. You can actually, if you go to the Smithsonian Channel, we have an hour-long TV special about Titanobo, a monster snake. That exhibit is coming here. But we've been talking about the past. And now I'm going to make you a little unhappy, but then I'm going to make you happy. Because the past is prologue. Why do we care so much about the past? Because it tells us about the future. We can actually reconstruct from the rock record how warm it was in the past and what the concentration of greenhouse gases were like and how the world's changed. Remember, the world of T-Rex, no polar ice. There's no ice in the Cretaceous. 
and sea waves cover continents. Well, this chart here shows the patterns of atmospheric carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gases that go into the atmosphere.